Ooh, if we take a look at these structures. Wow. So first off, let's just ignore that. Are these structures the same or different? Okay, different. Are these structures the same or different? Okay, are these structures the same or different? Okay. Admittedly, that was a bit leading because I gave you two options, same or different. So you just said all of those structures are different from each other. Are they all the same different? No. 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 If we take a look at the first two structures, where those atoms are located, yes, appears to be different, but they have the exact same formula. They're both C4H10. So if we look at formulas, can you really call them different? No, because they're the same formula, so they aren't really different. If we look at the last one, its formula is indeed different from the other ones. So we have different differences, which means we need better language to represent those differences. So one of the things that gets introduced in this chapter is coming up with ways to describe different. Different, the molecular formulas are different. I know, we're using the word to define the word, but just work with me. Okay. So this last structure is different from the first two because the last structure has five carbons and more hydrogens. I don't want to count them. Okay. Identical, the formulas are the same and the structures are superimposable. We'll deal with superimposable here in a second. Okay. <clears throat> That's what we're used to seeing, identical, same thing. Okay, isomers. Isomers are the molecular formulas are the same and the structures are not superimposable. Okay, so if we go through, let's make a quick modification. We now have these four structures. I'm gonna ignore different, so we establish that one's the same formula. If we go through and take a look at these, do these all have the same formula? Yes. Okay. So none of them are different from each other. Okay. Are any of them identical? Yes. And they all have the same formula, but now the question is, is it superimposable or is it not? So superimposable, let's see if I can pull out correct ones to do this, would be if I take these two pens, and this is where language gets all weird on me, because they're superposable and superimposable. Okay. What we're talking about is these two pens, could I overlay them, like turn them into ghosts? Okay, so that, and everybody's laughing, like ghosts, so they could pass through each other. Okay, so they're ghosts and they could pass through, would everything align? Yeah, they would all match up, right? Okay, so if we ghost them, so that they're all occupying the exact same space, that's one of them, superimposable, maybe, I think. Superposable is if we imagined that we ghosted them, but we can't really ghost them because they're physical objects, they would occupy the same space, which makes them superposable. So as you're going, isn't that the same thing? Welcome to the English language, right? Technically not, because they can't occupy physically the same space until we ghost them. Right, but that, both of them are getting at the same concept. They perfectly overlap. Kind of, sort of? Okay, let's take a look at the first two. Is there any way that I could get those first two structures to completely overlap? Okay, so if I used red and we tried to superpose or whatever, just the super word, Okay. We could show the red here and here, but then where's the next carbon? Going up. Okay. So this piece and this piece don't superimpose. There's no way that I could do any rotation, spins, or flips to get them to superimpose. Which means the relationship between those two structures is isomers. Okay. So we would define them now as isomers. Ah, these are now isomers.
Whoops, and I forgot that I had a little eraser in there. How about these two structures? Okay. So we'll do the same kind of thing. Here's the blue line. Okay, so I could go through and say, well, right here, right here, and then it goes right here. Right? Overlying. Most of that superimposed did all of it. So some people are saying yes, some people are saying no. Right? As it's drawn, does it look like it superimposes? No. So we might go through and call the relationship between those two isomers because they don't superimpose. But what must we also remember? Those are sigma bonds. The sigma bond can freely rotate. That bond right in the middle I can grab and turn. As I do that turning, what happens to this carbon? It aligns with the third carbon. It'll align there. Which then means they are superimposable. They are superimposable. The relationship between those two structures is that they are identical. Starting to see how this could potentially get complicated really fast. We're looking at pretty simple structures here. Okay, so we have to be very careful when we look at a structure to consider that rotation. This is why hybridization and bonding theory is important. Okay, you have to acknowledge that relevance. Make sense? Hi. So within that, we're looking at how those molecules can spin, flip, and rotate in three dimensions. This is where the model kits can come in handy. Okay. If we continue to pull out our models and look at our different representations, if we draw methane, we recognize it's a tetrahedral structure, four groups of electrons. We need the wedges and dashes to represent that. We can't draw that all in the plane of the paper. Okay. So to represent that we're coming out of the plane, we use a wedge. To represent that we're in the plane, we use a line to represent we're going behind the plane. Now we have the dash. So we come out with a wedge, in, solid, dashed back. Okay? That gives us this neat little drawing. We could also do a space filling model, okay, which is our uh, model where we can see our bonds. And we get the nice kind of pretty picture drawn out by some textbook publisher. Okay, with the little balls representing the atoms. And we can see the lines being the bonds. Okay, we could then shift to a space filling, which is a better representation of the actual excuse me, molecule, because we don't have sticks for bonds. It's the overlap of those spheres. And we can get that. Which of those best represents the three-dimensional model? The space filling. The space filling. Do you want to draw space-filling models? No. No. That's why we shift all the way back to the Lewis structure with our line angles. And that's, we draw those, but we have to realize what we're looking at is the space-filling model. Okay, so everything we're doing is imaginary. Okay. Welcome to the chocolate factory. Okay. So when we build a model, what we'd want to do is consider looking at that tetrahedral structure. So if you have a model, it's not a bad idea to pull it out. And we could look at this. Um, I did forget my model kit, but I think there's a bunch of sticks back here. So we're going to pause real quickly. Because you can see all the awesome models that Mike is using in his hands. OK, I just found random pieces back there. So ignore the colors. All right. So there's a tetrahedral structure. All right. Is it oriented right now like the drawing on the screen? No. Right? Because when you look at it, where's the plane of the paper? Your wedged atom is on which side of the structure? Here. Where is it? Left or right? Your left or right? Your right? It's your left, isn't it? Your left. Where is the wedge on that one? It's on your right. So this model does not represent that structure. 
that means we would need to draw it differently. Okay. What could I do to the model to make it represent that structure? So there. Now when you look at it, it represents that structure. Okay. These two, here's the plane of the paper. Sure, why not? Let's make fun of Jack. Plane of the paper running right through here. Everybody get it? Okay. Uh, draw the model for me now. You draw it, pencil and paper. And as you've now already started drawing, let me go ahead and show you where I want the plane of the paper to be. Those of you who are like, oh, I don't even know how to do that. Yeah, it's a bit challenging, isn't it? <laughs> Give me another 15 seconds, and then I'm going to have to put it down and do some drawing. At least help out the people at home a little bit. Instead of just listening to silence, let me mumble on. You're welcome, Amber. Can they hear us? You Not really. They hear me. What's hard not to? Not hear me. Apparently, my voice carries over on Yeah. Okay, we got it. Shoot, I actually already forgot how I was holding it. It's a dash up and down and then wedge to the sides. No, uh, you said dashed up and down, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Let's try that again. Do we have any solid lines? No. no. Why would you choose to draw it like this? Would anybody choose to draw a methane like that? You might be like, no. I have to do a lot more artistry work by showing wedges and dashes. That's painful to go through that process. Turns out there is a particular view on a molecule that does exactly that. Draws it like that. Okay? And it actually simplifies things. Okay? But we have to think about those representations and think about why we would show them like that. When we're looking at our structures, we're trying to keep them relatively simple. And so we're used to dealing with this kind of Lewis structure model where we keep everything solid. Right? Starting to get an idea of how to represent these three-dimensional objects. Yeah? OK. So let's make it more difficult. Draw out the structure for ethane. Because of speed, you should be done with that in 10 seconds. Okay, that was 10 seconds, just to give you an idea. I'm looking for somebody to have it drawn so that I can draw something else. Okay, so I won't draw something else quite yet. Saw a bunch of people with this answer. Fantastic, we have two carbons, six hydrogens, and you're wrong because of what we're moving into. We're moving into chapter four, which is looking at three dimensions. Are those carbons tetrahedral? Yes, which means you need to draw them in three dimensions. Fix your drawing, five seconds. Because it's three dimensions and I know I'm drawing tetrahedral, I know I need one wedge and one dash. So this is a possible answer that just looking around, I saw someone drew. Also wrong. 
And you're staring at it, but doesn't it have two solid lines, a wedge and a dash? Yes, it absolutely does. Your two solid lines are in the plane left and right. Please take this tetrahedral structure to get me two of these atoms in the plane with a bond left and right. You can't do it. You can't do it. Exactly right. You can't draw it that way. Okay, by drawing it that way, you've removed some information. Right? You're saying the representation exists that way, it can't. Okay? It physically cannot exist that way. You deserve to lose points for that. Okay? And that sounds nasty, I'm not trying to be mean. Okay? You deserve to draw, lose points because the representation that you've picked doesn't physically exist, which means any answers you try to come to by looking at that drawing will inherently be wrong. So that drawing is not allowed. Right? So it's not because I hate the way you draw or the way you see it. That's okay. You can see it that way. Just realize if you use your drawings that way, you will get answers wrong because that is not physically possible. Okay? So how can we fix it? Okay, so I'm going to do a quick fix. This now works. How is this different than what we have up here? What are the things that jump out at you? What do you got? The tetrahedrals are offset from each other. Okay. If we look, we have the solid lines kind of making a V. So we look, here's our solid line. I, this is going to be really dumb. I apologize. This. See, it's making a V, right? Do you see the V? It's an upside down V there. Okay. Where's the wedge and the dash? What are they also doing? They are also making a V going the opposite direction. That works at both carbon positions. So to draw a tetrahedral structure, you need two Vs. Okay. One V is solid, the other V is wedge and dash. If we look at the top drawing, we don't have two Vs. Okay. And you might go, well, I can just do a little tweak here, and now I have a V. Okay. It's how those V's intersect. Okay. You're overlapping the V's across each other, and that doesn't work. You can't physically orient the molecule to make that top drawing valid. So don't draw things that way. Recognize your tetrahedral structures need to match this shape. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. So I'm going to erase the top drawing. And because you know things are exciting and all that, we're going to draw something new and exciting because it is OCHEM. Laughing at that was not polite. Whoever did that laughter, that was not nice. This is OCHEM. It is exciting. New and exciting. Ta-da! What did I draw? So we've got a couple things coming out. A couple people have read ahead. That's good. You should be reading ahead. You should be into chapter four. You should be evaluating that kind of stuff. Some people jumped on kind of a cis trans. We take a look. The solid hydrogens are on the same side for the top one. The solid hydrogens are on opposite sides of that sigma bond for the bottom. So we might go through and call it cis trans. We can't call it cis and trans. When was cis and trans valid? Why double bonds and rings? They can't rotate. What can both of these structures do? Rotate. rotate. So I can't call this cis and trans. Okay. In second semester, we might change that terminology around a little bit, but at least in first semester, you can't call this cis and trans. Okay. But in referencing it as cis and trans, you might be calling attention to the fact that are those different structures? Well, if you're calling one cis and one trans, what are you saying? They're different structures. That's why you're calling one cis and one trans. Everybody else is saying, no, those aren't different. 
If you're calling them cis and trans, you've actually made a very good, important observation. Those are different structures. What? Okay, I don't have enough tetrahedral carbon, so I'm going to steal some stuff. No, I don't like it. Okay. What does that look like? Tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. So that's tetrahedral carbon number one. What is that? Another. Tetrahedral carbon number two. When I bond those two together, what do I get? Ta-da! I get that. I don't want to specify all the hydrogens on there, so I'm just implying that those extra points are hydrogens. Everybody get it? Okay, everybody see that? Which structure did I draw, top or bottom? Or did I build? Top. And some people are looking at it, oh, what the hell are you talking about? Plain in the paper? Okay. Those hydrogens are in the same plane. Those hydrogens wedged and dashed. Everybody see that? Okay. So I got a player. <laughs> There we go. After magic, ta-da! Which structure did I, did I build? Bottom, Bottom ta-da! Different thing. Did I do anything to it? It was rotated. What's that? Well, you can do better than that. It's by right hand. What's that? Oh, it's the same thing. Are these structures the same thing? Yeah? Here we go. Everybody see that? What do you see? Six lines. Six lines. Yes. Magic. What do you see? Three lines. Are they different? Yes. All right. That side view, was it obvious? Some people are like, yeah, it was totally obvious. You all are probably jerks, and the rest of the class hates you. <laughs> okay? For the rest of us, we might have to pull out the model kit to see that. And what we have to do is change our view on the molecule to see that new representation. And you might say, well, that doesn't make a big deal. That's just you turning your hand. That's not a big deal. What if I continue to turn my hand? Same direction. Like, there it is. I don't know which way I'm going. Let's say it's clockwise. And I turn, but I turn, kept turning it. So where my palm is facing you again. How many of you are going to be like, <gasps> <laughs> Why would you be like, <gasps> Because it doesn't turn that way. It doesn't turn that way. Why? Because you've got a bond in between your arm and your hand. There's a connection there. To make my hand turn that way, what do I have to do? I'd have to put a lot of energy in to force that. If we take a look at our structures again, what do each of those lines represent? A bond. What's in a bond? Electrons. electrons. And what do electrons do when they see other electrons? They run away. When I look down that, those electrons are occupying what? The, same. the exact same plane, which means they're scared. Run away. What has now happened? They're no longer in the same plane. So what does that mean? In one case, they're scared. In one case, they're safe. When are you higher in energy? When they're scared. Same thing is happening with our structures. Okay? To visualize that, we really need to look at the models to see it. Okay? Some people were awesome at it and could just come up with it. Okay? Though some people get famous enough for showing that representation and showing the rest of the world that their name gets forever attached to that kind of representation of the molecule. And we'll see that in just a second. Right. Pieces from this. Sigma bond rotate. That can change how we draw the structure. That doesn't change the identity of the compound. So we have to be very careful when looking at a drawing to recognize that three-dimensional structures, sigma bonds can rotate making two apparently different structures the same. So you have to watch out for that. Okay? Which means when we get through and look at our classifications, 
Right? When we walked through this one, for instance, these two, there's a sigma bond rotation in that. That sigma bond rotation you're responsible for acknowledging exists so that you can then identify the relationship between them. Well, how would you identify the relationship? We get flow charts. So we pick any two structures, A and B, and we evaluate, do they have the same molecular formula? So in the case of the red box, yes. yes. So I then move to a new box and I ask a new question. Are they superimposable? Okay. They don't look it, but I have to remember the sigma bond rotation and I'm responsible for knowing that to be true. Is one of the rotations allow them to entirely superimpose? Yes. yes. That means they're identical. Okay? What if I tried another pairing? Do they have the same molecular formula? No. No, which means they're different. They're different. Okay, so that was a pretty fast dead end, so let's do fix it. Do they have the same molecular formula? Yes. 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 Okay. Are they superimposable? No. no, which makes them isomers. isomers. Do they have the same atom connectivity? Yes. No. Okay. For addressing atom connectivity, I have one, two, three carbons, right? Three carbons and a A methyl. One, two, three carbons and a methyl. Where's the methyl connected? So we can go with end carbon, and I'm going to jump all over that, because end carbon is going to be a bad one. What should we actually be saying? At the one position, which is all sorts of weird in a, a whole other context. But if we think about numbering, we want it to happen at the earliest one. So at the bottom structure, the methyl is connected to carbon number. One in the top structure is connected to carbon number. Two. Two. Do they have the same atom connectivity? No. 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 They're now structural isomers. Okay. Eh? Kind of get it? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't make it easy, but that's what we're trying to fall through and flow chart out. Yes. It's there are other words used for structural. Constitutional isomers is the same thing. Okay. So you can reference structures as constitutional or structural. I would love to say I'm consistent and you always use structural. It's not true. Okay. On a test, if you're like, I don't know which one this is, let me know and I'll clarify. Yes? If on that top one, the methyl group was on the first carbon, but coming upward, would it then make it a stereoisomer? Is that what that would be? Okay. So I like where you're going with that, because in this flow chart, we just talked about different isomers, identical, and structural isomers, but we didn't hit stereoisomers. Okay. So I like that thought. That slide actually shows up a little bit later, but since you brought it up, let's address it real quickly. So if anybody gets mad, you know who to blame. Your name was Amber, right? Okay, she's saying if we move it over there, right? And you also said made it wedged, right? Coming out at you. Is that what you're saying? Sure. Sure? Okay. Does that make it a stereoisomer? No. It's still a structural isomer. Okay. So really what I think you want to fish for is the hell's a stereoisomer? Okay, I agree. I like that idea. Let's do it. This is literally one of the slides later on, just so you know. Make sure I don't goof this. Yep. Monkey dog, sorry, I gotta. It's down, up, down, and then wedge down. No, I didn't want that. What's the relationship? Do they have the same molecular formula? Yes. Yes. Are they superimposable? No. Well, it's four carbons and one chlorine. The chlorine's connected to position two. Aren't those superimposable? But if I rotate it, 
If this is my carbon backbone, does that superimpose? No, okay, so maybe what we would need to do is take that structure and flip it over. So I'm gonna take it and just kind of flip upwards. So it would be D, 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 right? I'm just gonna draw the chlorine there for the moment. Everybody see the carbon backbone now superimposes? Yeah, and then the chlorine would still be at position two because all I do is just take the structure and, right? Let's ignore the chlorine for the moment. So we would say, superimposable or not? Yes, the backbone aligned, the chlorine's in the same position, that should be superimposable. Where was the chlorine aimed? Towards you. When I flip my hand, where is it aimed? So what's the chlorine now? It's now dashed. Does the chlorine superimpose? No, it does not superimpose. So those are now isomers. Do they have the same atom connectivity? Where's the chlorine located? Carbon, two. Carbon number two. Yes, those structures are stereoisomers. Getting the idea that that can be insanely tricky? You can see wedges and dashes and be like, oh, they're all wedges, so it's okay. Uh, no, because you can flip and rotate and do all sorts of nasty things to the structure. You have to be aware of each of those modes of rotation. So these are now stereoisomers. Are you glad you asked? Or now you're like, damn it. Now I'm it. <laughs> right. There are other ways to look at those representations. You can use words to help try and define them. Ultimately, it's still a challenge to recognize those stereoisomers. Okay, those are arguably the hardest part. Thankfully, guess where stereoisomers show up? Chapter 5. Sorry, you don't get lucky. It's not, in, it's not in, sec, in semester 2. It's in chapter 5. All right? So, in our ethane drawings, we could go through and look at Lewis structures. We could look at line angles. That's what we went through and did and looked at those representations. All right? Those look prettier now. We could see that, that pseudo cis, okay? where our solids are on the same side of our sigma bond versus on opposite sides. If you want to call it pseudo-cis, I'll be okay with that. Don't call it cis and trans, but pseudo-cis, pseudo-trans, that's okay. Yes? Are those, um, are cis and trans examples of stereoisomers? We'll open that can later. Okay. So if we were to draw one or the other, would you, you want to get any points taken off? So that's an interesting question. If I asked you to draw ethane, which of those should you draw? Either one, there's no difference at that point. If I asked you to draw the lower energy ethane, now there's a difference. If I asked you to draw the higher energy one, yeah, now there's a difference. Okay. So it's all going to be in what the question is that's being asked. So you have to be very careful with that. Okay. And so to help see that, that's where we said, well, we need to change our viewpoint. We take our eyeball and we look down the bond. And we look down the bond for that first one, what would our drawing look like? This one would look like okay. with all those then being hydrogens out there, right? That becomes difficult to process because that looks like now how many atoms? That looks like four in the red case. There's a lot more than four. Okay. In the blue case, it looks like seven. It's still not right. Okay. So if I'm going to try to come up with a drawing to represent these, I want to add some more information to this so that I can better see that information, that all of those atoms are present. Okay. If we looked at that projection, what happened to this back carbon? Do you see it anymore? No. no, because it's further away, it's small, so we wouldn't see it. We would only see the front carbon. Okay. So what we're going to end up doing is doing an invert in how we would visualize this. And we're going to make the back carbon larger in the drawing. Because the front carbon's in front, we'll always see that. So to see the back carbon, I need to make it bigger so that I can 
have that pop out. What is larger than a point? A circle. That circle is now my back carbon. What is the point in front? This is now my front carbon. Those red lines would now go out to my hydrogens. And I just realized I could entirely color code this, so let's fix that. There we go. Doesn't that back carbon have hydrogens connected to it? Where are those hydrogens? Directly behind the red ones. So it's going to be really hard to draw that because I could just kind of go through. That just looks awful. So I do a slight tweak to this. My slight tweak is that when I draw this conformation, I'm going to draw it ever so slightly to the side to represent that those are overlapping with each other. Everybody see it? Notice, take a look at those bonds, those blue hydrogen bonds. They go to what point? They go to the back carbon. Those bonds don't continue all the way through into the middle. They stop at that outer carbon. Why? Where are they bonded? The outer carbon. If I draw the line all the way into the middle, what am I saying? They're bonded to the front carbon. That's now wrong. Okay. We can do the same thing with the other drawing. Uh, do I actually have it done pretty? Yeah, I have it done pretty. So I'm not going to draw that one out by hand, but I will do some magic. Uh, let's try that again. I'll do some magic. And again. Ta-da! There's our representation. Okay. This is a change in the view on the molecule. We might have initially said, based off of those two, two, those two initial structures that we had up here, that it, there was no difference. Because someone went through and said, actually, there is a difference. We attach a name to it for their view on the molecule. That name is a Newman projection. Okay. So not only do we have to interpret three-dimensional rotations and space around line angle drawings, we also have to be able to interpret them around Newman projections. Okay? But that isn't that bad, right? It's only two carbons, six hydrogens, they all just align, everything's fine and dandy, except what if we jumped up to butane? Okay? Spend a minute and draw them. Draw out butane, give me a Newman projection. I don't care which butane, I don't care which rotation of butane, okay? and I don't really care um, which Newman projection on butane, but draw one out. Okay. Ideally, you would now have a second that you could look at other people's work and see what you drew okay, to get an idea of speed, because that is going to be something that's important here, is coming up with these as fast as humanly possible. Okay. So number one, for butane, we wanted a Lewis structure. Done. I saw a lot of answers that had CH3, hydrogens, 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 CH3. I don't need to show any of that. I wouldn't ask to. A Lewis structure is just done. There it is, the zigzag. Okay, we can imply hydrogens, we can imply carbons. Okay. If I'm now going to do a Newman projection, the Newman projection is looking down a particular carbon-carbon bond, okay, or really any atom bond, but the carbon-carbon one's the most relevant. You could have looked down the carbon-1-2 bond. That's fine. That's not going to add any useful information. The useful information we're going to see is if we look down the 2-3 bond. So if I look down that 2-3 bond, uh, I'm just going to erase all of that, and we're going to look at it this way. There's my red carbon. Here's my blue carbon. Methyl, methyl. There's my Lewis structure, right? Red carbon, I'm going to say, is the front. So it's a point. Where's my methyl group aimed? Up. Okay, not only is it up, it's also in the plane of the paper. How do I know it's in the plane of the paper? 
It's a solid line. Okay. To finish out that structure, it also has two hydrogens connected to it. There's my two hydrogens. The back carbon in blue. Where's my methyl located? Okay, on the back carbon, it's now aimed straight down, directly opposite the first methyl I drew. Where are my hydrogens? Directly out to the side. Do you have to be that specific with the placement of each of those hydrogens? Okay, for instance, could I have drawn this? That is now a physical impossibility. That is physically impossible because I've now shrunken the bond angle between the methyl and the hydrogen. There's no way I would ever be able to look at the molecule to get that to be true. Okay? Because I can't get that to be true, I better not draw it because I'll start doing wrong interpretations. I now have this representation. Did everybody get this representation or did you get something else? Okay. It's basically upside down. Uh, just upside down doesn't count. Okay. Here's another representation we could have gotten. But Mike, there's no difference. I'm not done. Of course, I drew that technically in the wrong spot. What's the Lewis structure for the one I've now drawn? Okay. This one corresponds to there. This one corresponds to there. Everybody see that? Okay. So now, of course, the follow-up question, are those identical structures? Okay. Of course, we're fishing for weird words. The use of the term identical means, yeah, are they equal energy structures? No. One of them is higher in energy than the other. So while they are identical structures, they have different energies. Which one is higher in energy? The right one is higher in energy. Awesome. You guys jumped all over that one. I know that's on the right. Let's try that again. Higher in energy, and this one would be lower in energy. Why? Because once you go around there, and you're just like getting close to each other, the hydrogens from those CH3s are going to get close to each other. Eclipsed, right? Versus staggered. Which we didn't drop those names on the previous one when we looked at ethane, but it works. These bonds eclipse each other. They're covering each other up. In the other case, they're staggered. All right, they alternate out. Is there another way I could have drawn this structure? Yes. yes. Several. Serious? I don't, I don't need to show the methyl wedged. Why might I bother to do this? If that's wedged, remember I'm looking at it from this side. The methyl is coming out of the plane, which means it's coming onto what side of my body? Yes, the right-hand side. Don't jump too far ahead. Uh, I've got this way too cluttered. That structure versus that one. Which one's higher in energy? Right or left? Still the right. The left is lower in energy because it's staggered. This one's still eclipsed. So staggered conformation is lower in energy. Okay, of course, what's the next question going to be? Now between those two, which one's lower in energy? Why is the middle one lower in energy? 
they're farther apart from each other. I've taken those methyl groups, which are larger than hydrogens. They're larger because they have... We can go simpler than that. They have more electrons. Simple as that. More electrons means... More space. Bigger. They're occupying more space. I want those groups as far away from each other as possible. Because I now have these multiple representations, I need to come up with ways to go through and name these multiple representations. All right? So when we looked at our ethane structures, just two carbons, everybody see those are just two carbons? How do you know they're just two carbons? We look at each of those bonds, and each of those bonds is hydrogen. There's a carbon as the point in front, and there's a carbon as the circle in back. There's only two carbons. Those are ethane. The top one, being higher in energy, ends up being what name? Twilight. The one underneath is? Staggered. Staggered. When we move up to butane, what happens? Now those X's aren't X's. They would be? CH3s. They could really be anything, and this naming system is still going to hold. Okay, as long as they aren't hydrogens, there is now a difference between these two staggered conformations. Because they are named or have different energies, I have to come up with different names to represent them. I would argue the last one's the easiest one. They're on opposite sides of our sigma bond, right? Okay, what is the opposite of a bond? An antibond, what's the confirmation name? Don't tell me antibond, just drop the bond. Anti, anti. this is an anti-confirmation. We could be extra accurate and call it anti-staggered. I would argue that's not necessary. Okay. And it's anti. The next one's a little bit weird. Okay. That name isn't super obvious. Okay. Last year, someone came up with an awesome example for this. So if you any have heard of like man laws, okay? So maybe, maybe not. So man laws, you walk into a bathroom as a man, there's a bunch of urinals, okay? No one's at the urinals, you get your pick. Someone's standing at one of the urinals. Which urinal do you go to? The, one. the one furthest from them. Because <laughs> if you start peeing in the same urinal right next to them, that becomes a bit weird or awkward. Anybody know any French? If you speak French, guess what the word for awkward is? Gauche, gauche, something like that. These guys are peeing right next to each other. Not cool. That's a bit awkward. Okay? Those of you who never had to experience a urinal, now you know. Don't pee next to somebody. Okay? I wonder if there's a, a, a woman law that's similar to it, but there's at least barricades, so it's less. <laughs> okay. And man laws are largely made up anyway. Okay? So we have the gauche interaction and the anti-interaction. Okay. Make sense? So are they interchangeable, like gauche and eclipse and staggered in atoms? Is gauche the same thing as eclipsed? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Gauche is a staggered conformation. Okay. Arguably, we could say the eclipsed is peeing in the same urinal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, you don't want to eclipse somebody while you're peeing in the urinal. That's just weird. <laughs> That's not going to work. Okay. Don't cross the streams. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we stand right next to them, it's a little awkward. We want a little bit of space. But not as awkward as peeing in the same urinal. Okay? We could use this for women too, right? You go in and you, you pick the stall. You don't use the same stall as somebody else. That's kind of eclipsed. Okay? That's really awkward. Kind of? So, eclipsed. Staggered, I would argue staggered, we should kind of just ignore and switch to gauche and anti. Make sense? 
Hi. Those are our Newman projections. We're changing our view on the molecule to come up with a new interpretation for it. We can apply this all the way out. We just talked about the energetics of each of these, which means what could we do with that? 152. Nobody does it in the 152. I think maybe Brian does. The whole point of 152 is to do what? Equilibrium. What is equilibrium talking about? What is the point of doing equilibrium? Reaction. This is equilibrium. What is that? Kinetics. The whole point of 152 is to make this drawing. That's it. Everything you did is describing that. What is that drawing? A reaction. Potentially a reaction. What would be the labels that you could draw on this? Energy. We can open up the whole enthalpy thing. That that's causes some rough spots for me. And a reaction coordinate. What we're looking at here is an energy diagram. That's all you did in 152 was make energy diagrams. You just didn't realize that that's what you were doing. You just quantified each of those stages. That's 152. Okay. When we move into second semester OCHEM, we talk about energy diagrams a lot, which is why you need 152. Okay. So energy diagram means if I look at the rotation for a butane, about that bond, what would my energy diagram look like? So this one, totally eclipsed, really high in energy. Okay, so that probably means a line up here. This one, gauche. That's high energy, but is it as high as this one? No, so if I just compared between those two, well, that's pretty darn low. So let's drop it down here. What's the next one? Eclipsed. That's got to be higher than the... <coughs> <laughs> Pancakes. Drink some water. That's got to be higher than the gauche. Is it as high as the first eclipsed? No. 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 So if I went through and drew it, I'd get something like that. Is that obvious? A little lower. Is that better? Sorry. What's the next one? Really, 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 really low. So it's down there. What's the next one? That's eclipsed again. Where eclipsed? The same as the gauche one. The next one. And then the last one. All the way back. All we've done is identify the energetics of each of those individual states. If we're going to do an energy diagram now, what do we get to do? We get to go back to kindergarten, and we get to connect the dots. And we now have an energy diagram. That energy diagram represents the rotation about that structure. Does it have to start my drawing at the highest energy? No. Do I have to start at any one of those positions in particular? Not necessarily which means you could be asked, say, start from this gauche interaction, draw the rest of the interactions, your energy diagram. Okay? You would then have to make sure your label matched out. So the diagram itself may change. Represent the energy of each of the individual molecules, and it doesn't matter. Connect the dots after you've established those energetic differences. Kind of make sense? Uh, actually, before we do that, notice there's a bunch of numbers up there. I don't care. Okay. Relative energies. That's all I want. Okay. Uh, yeah, you should kind of reference the degrees. Really, it's just doing the rotation and deciding where are you happiest. So arguably, the degrees aren't that big of a deal either. Okay. The next part of Chapter 4, the second half, goes into cycloalkanes. So now we're saying instead of a chain of carbons... I bring that chain back and I have it bite its tail. So you end up with a circle okay, or a cyclic structure. For those of you in model kits, you can try to go through and build your cyclic structures 
and you will start to evaluate some of the kind of potential reactivities behind these. Cyclopropane means three carbons. How many carbons do I have here? Three. three. To make a cyclopropane, I, I will buy you a new kit if I break it. <laughs> what would I have to do? I don't want to buy a new kit. Okay? You will very quickly find that that's going to be a really hard angle to crank down on. Because what is the hybridization of those carbons? SP3. To get a cyclopropane, what must that bond angle be inside? 60. I'm taking something that wants to be SP3 and what bond angle? 109.5. And I'm trying to make it 60. Is it going to be happy about that? No. No. Right? So when we think about our structures and these cyclic structures, that's where I want you to be going. There are names for each of those. In the Newman projection, we're talking about the like electrons overlapping. They reference it as torsional strain. Yeah, cool. I don't care that it's called torsional strain. I care that you recognize there's an energy issue there. Right? Those are saying, well, that's kind of weird. You haven't done that before. All I have to say is... Nomenclature. I don't care about naming. I care about understanding what those structures are doing. Okay? The strain here isn't a torsional strain because the torsional strain is talking about a rotation. So it's a different type of, of thing. So, of course, we come up with a different name for it. I don't care what it is. I think it's angle strain in this one. Okay? It sounds right. Okay? So you could go through and attempt to build these with these kits, the Darling models, I don't recommend building smaller than five rings. The cyclobutanes, I think you can pull off with these. The propanes will break the model. Okay? If you use the gray box or even the HGS kit, which it doesn't look like anybody has the HGS, HGS kit, um, I think you can pull off the cyclopropanes. It's hard, and as you do it, it has a tendency to like pop and start throwing pieces. So wearing goggles is not a bad idea. Okay? So lots of strain there. When you move up to the butane, we're opening that angle a little bit. Instead of it being 60, it becomes what shape would that be with four points? 90. A square, which would mean 90 <laughs> degrees as an angle. Okay. As we add more and more carbons, we start to alleviate more and more stress on the structure. But one of an extra kind of feature pops out of this. If we look at building those kits, or those, ah, that's all, okay? We might go, well, isn't it planar? And if you look, even as I'm holding it, are all of those carbons in the same plane? Yeah. Kinda, sorta, but if you take it and build it and just kinda wiggle it a little bit, mm -hmm. you'll find that where they're all in the same plane actually feels kinda tight. Mm -hmm. It's kinda tight because there's some angle strain. If you pucker it a little bit where it gets happy, are they all in the same plane? No, they kick out of it. Okay? So instead of being all nice and drawn like a nice flat line, we have to recognize that cyclopentane, hexane, heptane, those forward are not planar molecules. Believe it or not, neither is butane. Okay? And there's all sorts of kind of secondary layers that contribute to the complexity of that. For instance, let's take a look at the cyclopentane right here where I'm pointing. What does that kind of look like to you? The hint begins with an N. E, N, E. It's a Newman projection. And when we look at that Newman projection, you'll notice that those bonds kind of overlap, but not quite. If we put them all into the same plane, Ah, what happened to my Newman projection? Now they definitely overlap. Now they definitely overlap. Why do we get the bending? So Reducing that we break energy. that strain from the Newman projection, and we don't get as much of an overlap. That's not a happy thing, so it still makes it a little bit more reactive. So what happens if we add yet another carbon up to hexane? And we look down that same bond... Why aren't you 
aren't you doing it? Okay, never mind. Let's just ignore that for the moment. Look down that same bond, what happened? They're almost completely offset. They're almost completely offset. You mean completely offset like the? Anti. Staggered conformation. Okay. Would they be anti? What are we referencing in this case to be anti? You could say where I'm pointing now and here are anti. Yes, I agree with that. Do I care about that? What are those atoms? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. So I probably don't care about that. Where would I like to point to reference the energy of this staggered conformation? The carbons coming out from your gauche. The carbons of the ring, and those happen to be gauche to each other. If I tried to ring flip or move it around, would I ever be able to get them so that they were anti to each other? No. No. Right? So cool, we looked at it, we saw a nice little, what we would refer to as an overhead view, our cyclohexane. We looked at it and saw a Newman projection. You turn it this way and what do you get? You're really like, you don't get crap, you got a bunch of sticks flying in the air. <laughs> right here, right there, and right there. So for those people at home, what we'd be drawing would be something looking kind of like this, right there. Right there, right there. I have no idea what that looks like. Anybody? Chair. It's a chair. When we look at cyclohexanes, guess what we end up referencing a bunch? Chairs. Because when we look at it in this conformation, remember that Newman projection where they were all staggered? It happens to be the lowest energy conformation for a cyclohexane, which makes a chair. And for those of you being like, that is the goofiest looking chair. It doesn't matter what you think. That's what we call it. Deal with it. Okay? Just like gauche, okay? without the funny analogy. Okay? We just get a chair. Okay, so we have to visualize and look at our cyclohexanes and understand that chair. Okay? So we could go through and look at something along these lines. I don't want to look at that one. Okay? Building out models and look at these structures from the side. When we're looking at it with a cyclopentane, what kind of representation do we get? Of course, this doesn't work very well in this day and age. We look at it kind of from the side. We get a little lip on it. So we get these four corners all in the same plane, and we get a little lip. A little lip that kind of folds, right? Kind of like envelope. an envelope. We have the envelope conformation for cyclopentanes. That's what they're called. When we move up to the ring, or sorry, move up and add a carbon, and we get our cyclohexane. Come on, bonds. We get our chair. We get a boat. Okay, we get another chair. You're like, dude, it's still a chair. This chair faces which direction? You sat in it. Where would you face? You face that way. There's your back. There's where you put your feet. But if I do this, you're facing the other direction. But that doesn't matter, right? Yeah, it does. All right, and we'll see that. So what you're responsible for doing is being able to recognize these chairs and being able to draw them is going to become of critical importance. Right? So how could we go through and draw that? Because anybody looking at that, you're like, yes, I can totally draw a chair. Everybody's saying no. Okay, cool. So here's what we're going to do. Okay? I'm going to draw a chair. I'm going to start by drawing the seat okay? on where I'm going to put my butt. So I'm going to draw two lines, and I'm going to stagger them. Notice how they're staggered roughly the same length? Everybody agree with that? Yes. Okay. I could also draw two lines staggered the other direction. Everybody see that? Did I stagger them the other way? I did. Yeah? Step two. Pick the left or right side. I don't care which side. Okay, because these are two different chairs. So which one do you want to look at, left or right? Left. Left. So let's go left. Which side of the left chair do you want to look at, left or right? Left, I agree. You're going to cut your structure roughly in half. And we look at the left-hand side. Which of those two lines is shorter? The bottom one 
this length right here is shorter than that length right there. No, no, no. That one is shorter than that one, right? So the top one is shorter on that half, yes? I'm going to pick that point, and I'm going to draw a bond. OK? Now I can connect. Ta-da. Uh, do I want to complete? Uh, actually, because it says colors orange. I connect. Now I repeat that process on the other side. On the other side, which side is shorter, the top line or the bottom line? Bottom, bottom line, which means I'm going to draw down. Connect. If I sat in this chair, which direction do I face? Right. I'm inverted. That's why I drew an arrow. Okay. How about the other chair? Which side do you want to look at, left or right? Left. Which line is shorter, top or bottom? Top. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. The bottom. bottom. The bottom. So I'm going to draw my line going down. Connect. Repeat on the other side. The top one is shorter. Connect. If I sat in this one, I'm now facing that direction. I've now drawn a chair. And not only have I drawn one chair, I've drawn two chairs aimed opposite directions. This is fantastic and phenomenal. You need to be able to do this. Okay. Kind of, sort of? Cool. Okay. Are there different energies for our chairs? Yes. How would we visualize the energy for a chair? Which drawing gives us information about energies? The hint begins with an N. Newman projections. The Newman projections. You're like, I have to do a Newman projection with a mother having chair? Yes. Yes, you do. Okay, and it kind of sucks. But there we go. In this chair, I'm now using my eyeballs. And notice there's two eyeballs. Why are there two eyeballs? You're looking at two eyeballs. There are two Newman projections that are interconnected to each other. Exciting stuff. You're like, Newman, I finally got that. Double up. All right? Sort of. <clears throat> what happens if we chair flip? Right? If we chair flip, we take the back of the chair, becomes feet. We take our old feet, and it becomes a head. What's going to happen to our chair? Our Newman projection. If you were sitting in this Newman projection, where are you facing? If I got up and somehow climbed into the screen, where would I sit? If I sat in that, where would I be facing? Okay, this is fun. We're getting hands every direction. Fun thing about chairs, and this is what makes it challenging, is depending on what you see, you may see a different chair. So right now, I'm trying to show the chair here. There's also a chair aimed this way and this way. There's cha chairs up the yin-yang in this. And for those of you having a hard time seeing that, that's because we aren't staring at each other eye to eye with the model in between where I can point to all of them. If you climb into this chair, the easiest place to see it, the Newman projections are, guess what? Your seat. Where's your head? Where's your feet? In the front. If I sat in that chair, guess where I'm staring? Us. Straight out out of it. Right out at you. Okay, exciting stuff. Shaking your head like, I'm not staring at you ever again. Okay? If we did a chair flip, the feet need to do what? Come up. Go up. What's going to happen to all these bonds? They're going to rotate. They're gonna rotate. Right? And you see the chair bonds, those angles kind of flip and rotate around. Now when I sit in it, where would I be facing? Away from us. I'd be facing into the wall. Okay? It takes practice to visualize these, okay? but the main reason we want to talk about it is that if we go through and look at those atoms, those hydrogens on there, added some labels, a red E and a blue A. We'll talk about those in a second. But if I go through and do the chair flip... Oh, please say, I hand. okay, thank God. What happens? All I did was a chair flip, okay? Notice what happens to the red E. Instead of being aimed outwards, now where is it being aimed? 
straight up and down, right? The blue A was aimed straight up and down. When I go through and do the chair flip, where is it aimed? Off to the side. All of a sudden, by going through a chair flip, I can change where those atoms are located with respect to the molecule. Does that change the energy? Okay. If we all got up now, because it's time to end class, and I asked you all to stand on one leg, have you changed the orientation of your one leg? Okay. Have I changed the orientation of that one leg? Is that a different energy than me standing on two feet? Yeah. Yes, guess what? They're different energies. Which one's higher? Which one's lower? I wonder if we could apply the same rules from Newman to this.